hooked up here. Okay. You pick up your Bible and you read uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we say those are gospels, gospel accounts. And today I'm going to bring you a lesson entitled The Gospel According to You. Now, that's a little different than what those accounts are because they were eyewitnesses. We're witnesses, but we're not eyewitnesses. But I want to begin by asking you on your outline, how do you measure your Christianity? There are a lot of things that we could put up there. Their attendance, church attendance. Well, boy, if that's the measure of what faithfulness is, then there's an awful lot of people today who are not faithful. We might say it's things you do, it's programs you participate in, it's how you serve others. I'm going to use the church at Corinth today as my jumping off place. And I have up here that they seem to be doing it by sin because that church was riddled with sin. They had all kinds of it. And at least on one occasion, Paul says, and you're proud of it. You're proud of it. And yet those people had some good things. They had been blessed above all other churches in the spiritual gifts. And they were using those spiritual gifts and they were making converts. And if you were to ask one of them, well, are you faithful or not? And you know what they would say? Yes. They would say yes. Paul lists those spiritual gifts in chapters 12 through 14. And they would take those things and they used them, but they were saying, mine's better than yours. I am more important in the church than you are. And they were factioned. Chapter 11 says they couldn't even take the Lord's Supper properly. Hmm. Well, at the end of chapter 12, Paul promised them to show them a better way. The King James Version says a more excellent way. A better way. And so we're going to use chapter 13 today, and we're going to be talking about love. It is that more excellent way. And I've divided the chapter up into three parts. The first part is the value of love. And I don't have that on your outline, so you may want to write that down there. The first three verses talk about the value of love. And Paul begins by making a reference back to those spiritual gifts. They had all those things they could do. They could uh, speak in languages. They could uh, raise the dead. They could heal the sick. They could do all kinds of different things. And so Paul begins with the tongues of men. If I have the tongues of men and don't have love, I am nothing, he says. In that time period, there were over 70 languages known. If you go back to Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that there was gathered from every nation under heaven. And each man heard in his own language. It may be that they could talk in all those languages Maybe they couldn't. Paul goes on and he says, even though I have the tongues of angels and they believe that there was a language that you could understand if you really worked at it, that the angels spoke in heaven. So if I had all the tongues of men and if I could speak in the language of heaven and I don't have love, I am nothing. So the value of love. I am nothing. I have not love. I am become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Most people think that that sounding brass was the gong at the temple in Corinth, not the one in Jerusalem. 
It called people together, but it did not tell them why they were coming together. Sometimes it was for worship. Sometimes it was for announcements. Sometimes it was to go to battle. They did not know what that gong meant. They understood that. The tinkling symbol is a term which looks like probably a person dropped the lid of a pot. And it made this noise, but it didn't say anything. So Paul is saying, even though I talk, could talk in those languages, and even though I talked in the heavenly language, if I don't have love, I'm no more than dropping a pot lid. That's all. So on your outline, without love, I'm nothing. You put it in terms you understand religiously. My faith doesn't do anything and my religion my worship is not worth anything if I don't have love that's how important this is so the value of love without love I'm nothing and God does not accept my religion so what what is this love that's so valuable that it can keep me out of heaven or it can allow me in? Well, I want to begin with God's love demonstrated for us. And of course, you know, you've got to start with the gift of Jesus in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. It is an action word. I think Clint Black had a country song <laughs> entitled, Love is a Verb. <laughs> well, it is. This kind of love is a verb. It's something you do. And God did when he gave Jesus. And the result of God giving Jesus is that the church exists. In Ephesians 3, and 8, uh, chapter 3, verses 10 through 19, Paul tells those people there that the church is the one that is going to develop or going to employ or going to disperse the manifold wisdom of God. He says there, it is there where you have the hope that you can ask and God can do so much more than you can ask or think. It is God's savings box, if you will, depository of those who he's going to save by the blood of Jesus. The result of that, we're adopted into his family. We're given his name Christian. And 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1 says, You are called the children of God. You're a saint. You're saved. Adopted into his family. Well, we could go on with that, but these, I, I would just want to put these up here to show you that they're for our benefit. God does not intend on hurting you. God does not intend on harming you. His intent is saving you. That's why Jesus came. That's why the Old Testament was written to bring us to Christ. And that's why the New Testament is given so we can stay there. His intent is saving us. Well, verses 4 through 7 describes the love of God that we are to have, that we are to express to others. On your outline, this is the only place in the Bible where the definition of love is given. The only place. It is so important that it can nullify our religion. And this is the only place that I'm going to find it. That's how important it is. This is not wishy-washy stuff. This is not stuff that you have real good feelings about. Warm fuzziness. That's not what this is. For you see, this describes the character of God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love. This describes who our God is. And it describes 
as we partake of it and we develop it, according to Peter, the divine nature. There's nothing else given that's the divine nature that we are to have. And when you look at Galatians chapter 5, it is where the Holy Spirit goes to work on you. And the very first thing he does, love. Love. So let's look at it. Verse 4 says it suffers long. That means it puts up with you. Get on my nerves, but I'm going to put up with you. I don't like the way you, whatever, but I'm going to put up with you. I'm going to allow you your space. And then he says, it envies not. It does not look at what you have and say, I want it. It does not look at your accomplishments and say, I wish I were you and you don't have that. But it relishes in others' doings and being and what they have. The King James says it vaunteth not itself. That is, it does not put itself forward. It does not have to be in the limelight. It does not have to be the center of attention. Vaunts not itself up. And then that leads to pride. It is not puffed up. Boy, that's hard. We are a proud people. I'm proud to be an American, the song says. I'm proud to be a, a Tennessean, and I am, I guess. But it puts self down. It, it takes that pride and doesn't allow it to get unholy. Verse 5 says, it does not behave itself unseemly. And it's hard for me to express that except that I know what I need to be like as a Christian and sometimes I don't act like it. God always acts appropriately in every single situation. And it is unseemly, it is uncharacteristic uh, of us if we are children of his to act out of that character he says it seeks not her own <laughs> it's kind of funny there that it changed it from masculine to feminine it seeks not her own that's okay because the Greeks used masculine and feminine and that's just the way that is it doesn't have anything to do with sexuality. It says that I will not strive to take something that could be mine rightfully if it's going to cause you harm. I will not take it away from you. It's not easily provoked. It takes a whole lot to get under your skin. Sometimes I lose it, yo. Sometimes things just get under my skin and my nature and I say things that are not in the right tone. I say things that are not in the right attitude, not of the right motive. Lord, help us. Help us. Thinks no evil. When you see somebody taking advantage of you or somebody else, it's hard not to think evil of them. It's hard to keep your mind to swear that you think the best of them, where you expect the best of them. It is hard. And it goes on then in verse 6. Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. And I have those two together for a very special reason. If the iniquity there in that passage means sin, 
think it probably does. Then truth then means righteousness. If truth means what we normally think of as truth, then iniquity means falsehood. I don't care which way you take it or if you take it some other way. What you see is the opposition of two poles. One is not holy, the other is. And that's what it says. We need to rejoice in holiness and we need not to rejoice in anything that's not. Verse 7 says it bears all things. That's an interesting phrase. It has to do with a cup that holds liquid and does not let it seep out or run out or it's not turned over. It holds the liquid. And when it says bears all things, with you look back over the things that he said before, it means when I see you doing something that you shouldn't be doing or saying something that you shouldn't be doing, I need to bear all things. Hold it in. Now I added to the definition there to stop gossip. That's not what I found. But I thought that would be a good application of it. It could be gossip. It could be anything that you've done. Stop it. Hold it in. And don't let others know it. That's what love is. In relationship to that, and it bounces off and is tied to and cannot be separated from. It believes all things, all things. What, that you've done all this wrong? No. It believes that you have the capacity and you really want to do what's right. It is positive in nature. And the hope there, if I apply the definition of Hebrews chapter 6, that says that hope is the expectation that God will always fulfill his will or his promises and he will never lie to me, then if I believe that you have the capacity to do right, I expect then in this passage for you to do that which is right. I expect for you to change. And then he says endures all things. And the endurance is I'm going to put up with you until you do. That's what that means. Whew. These are all outreaches. They're not me. They are me looking at you. They are me treating you. So this morning, I want you to stop for just a second and do some thinking I want you to think about one thing you can do today. Maybe it's tomorrow. Maybe it's next week. That you're going to do simply because you love God. I want you to think about it in terms of these parameters that Paul has put around us. How you're going to outreach to someone with the, because you love God. You're only going to do it because you love God. And you're going to affect someone positively. That is showing this love. So Paul began with the value of love. And now he's shown us the virtues of love that it intermixes, it involves other people. Now he too gives us the victory of love. And he says in verse 8, love never fails. Then he goes on and he says, but prophecies and tongues and knowledge, they're going to vanish away. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when we are completed or when we are perfected, that which is in part should be done away. But love never fails. So a couple who are on their way to divorce court. 
They really don't want to get a divorce, but they can see any way out of it. Love never fails. A person who's been reviewed on a job and gotten a bad review, they've got to say, okay, I'm going to be out of here if I don't change this. Love never fails. That is a promise to, of God. And so Paul gives two illustrations of that. The first one is when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spake as a child, he acted as a child in all things that are childish. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So a toddler in 15 years, about like these young people, you wouldn't want to be running around in a diaper now. You wouldn't want to be sucking your thumb in public. You wouldn't want to be eating pablum. No, why? Those are childish things, and now you're way beyond that. Now, I use those young people. You know I could use old people too, don't you? You would not want to be doing those kinds of things. And those of you who are older, look at these young people who are still developing. They're still gaining. They're still maturing. And you wouldn't want to be in their place. Y'all enjoy your youth. You got a reason to make mistakes. And we need to bear it. Mom and daddy. <laughs> you put away those childish things. So when you gain the experience and knowledge, we leave off those childish thoughts and ways. He then says, we see through a glass, either dimly, darkly, or unclear, depending on your version. Don't think about it as a window. That's not what it is. It would be nearer like a mirror, except they didn't have mirrors. And if you want to see about the image that Paul was talking about, go to your kitchen, pull out a stainless steel pot, and look at your image in it. That's the image that Paul is depicting here. And you can't see yourself clearly. And Paul says, we're still not seeing ourselves clearly. He says, we know in part, as I am known. People can see you and see your faults and see your shortcomings and see where you don't live up to the, the thing of God. That's why we have mercy and grace and forgiveness. So this morning, I want you to measure your faith by the ruler of love. I want you to see that that's what God's looking at. And when I look at Matthew 25, where Jesus is talking to these people about the judgment, he's not talking about, did you use instrumental music or not? He's not talking about, did you do this, that, or another? He's talking about, I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you fed me. Lord, when do we do these things? And as much as you did it unto the least of one of these, you've done it unto me. That's the ruler God's going to use at judgment, folks. Without love, I'm nothing. And we need to look at it closely. And now abides faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. And we say, well, charity is love. It is, but it's not. And I put it in here as charity because there's a difference. Charity was not in existence, that the word wasn't, until 1547 or 8, 
That's the first account we have of it. It is a combination between a Greek word, a Latin word, and a French word. And it means to reach out and to embellish. That's what it means. Charity. That's what Paul described in this chapter. So let's close this lesson down now where you can go home with something maybe you can remember. I don't know. Paul began with, you are nothing without love. That's the value of it. Don't you ever forget it. You are nothing without love. Then Paul proceeded to describe the virtues of it. He gave us all those, what it looks like. And he says it's seeking the best for others. It is a trait of God. And as we develop these virtues, we're developing the real biblical godliness. We're taking on us the nature of divine divinity or the nature of God. So in our worship services, hmm. You come here and we've sung some songs. And you did really a great job, Philip. Are we really loving God? Are we thinking about Him and about our relationship to Him and how we live with Him day by day? Are we thinking about lifting our lives from where we were to grow in our love? Or are we just coming here and singing a song. Calling the words. They don't mean anything. On tune, off tune. Loving God. Are we afraid to show our emotion for God in our service? When I was a boy. I remember when people led prayer at Springville, they raised their hand. Do you know where the raising of hands comes from? It's the image of the old priest who would take the scapegoat out and he would release it and raise his hands. And it is a release of sin. That's what it means. It's okay for you to say amen. <laughs> I was visiting a church in Dallas, Texas once. And there's this little old lady. She was a little black lady, old. I don't know how old she was, but she was old. Down the front row and she would amen just about everything. Amen, amen, amen. Guy sitting next to me, he was also busy. And I don't know where he was from, but he punched me and he said, we don't say amen where I go to church. <laughs> uh, I bet you don't. <laughs> we need to express our love for God. And sometimes it's verbal. And sometimes it's outward and it shows. And sometimes it may get on somebody else's nerves. We don't do that where I go. It's okay. I remember Brother Pulley at Springville. Every time he led in prayer, he'd get down on his knee. And every time somebody else would lead in prayer, he'd get down on his knee. Because he knelt before the great I Am. It's okay. If you want to kneel, there's nothing wrong with it. Express your emotion because it is a love of God. Well, we made a decision when we became a Christian, y'all. We made a decision, I will follow Jesus. Or in the context of our study this, this year, our whole context this year is walking with the Lord. My daily walk with God. Does that decision include godly love? I'm going to be a Christian. Am I going to do what a Christian ought to do? 
I'm going to follow the Lord. Am I going to reach out to others? Well, I want to tell you, spending time with Jesus will make that kind of a Christian out of you. And if I'm having trouble getting to that point of being uh, the kind of Christian that 1 Corinthians 13 describes, then I'm not probably not spending the time with Jesus that I ought to spend. Walking with Him. Well, after the value and the virtues of love, Paul gives us the victory. Love never fails. It will take us to glory. It is an adult kind of thing grown out of the childishness. It is a clear image like the mirror you have in your bathroom. You can see, here are changes I have made. Here are changes I need to make. And here is what I need to be in order to have the love for God that I should have. And I want you to know, it's the greatest thing in your religion. The greatest thing in your religion. There's nothing any more important. Because it is the gospel according to you. And as you pick up your Bible and you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are people out there who really don't know God, but they're looking at you and they're looking at you as an example of what a Christian is, and you become the gospel that they're reading. And they're using the yardstick. He says he's a Christian, but I think God is love. I think the Bible says that, doesn't it? And he's not showing it. I had a man one time tell me if that's what Christianity is I don't want any part of it another man told me one time if that is the kind of God you serve I don't want to be around him Lord help me I don't know about you but Lord help me to love as you have directed me to love not only you, but others.